that's actually a really great question. Um, so we filmed most of this film during 2013, 2014. And it was actually through making the film that um, we started having a lot of discussions. So to give you a little bit of a backstory about the Vagine regime and how, it's, how it became, um, what, it, it, what, what, what it was, is it was really created as a, as a safe space for lesbian skaters. Now that might seem weird in the current, um, you know, culture that you see up on that screen, but, you know, roller derby's been around about 12 years now, and back when I started 11 years ago, um, it, you know, there were places in the Midwest where skaters were being harassed. Um, there was a real need to have a kind of online group collective, and that was one of the reasons why Inger Rogers and others created the Vagine regime. Now, flash forward, 10 years, which is when the film was getting made, and clearly the culture had started to shift and change. And there was really not a necessarily, not, not to say that homophobia doesn't exist in roller derby, but there's, it wasn't probably as needed to have a like safe space for lesbian skaters. And the um, roller derby was just changing so much as well in terms of its trans policy, trans inclusion, having trans skaters be um, on your team. And currently the logo is completely getting reworked so that it is less, um, right now the logo is like two female skaters and like female um, bathroom, I don't know what you call it, bathroom icons that are like holding hands on skates. And we realized that the logo in and of itself is not you know, inclusive of a of a queer international collective, which is what the Vagine regime has kind of become. And right now the whole organization is going through a rebranding and also like new merch is being made, new logos are being created. And there's also a huge conversation about the name Vagine regime because Vagine, vagina, it is automatically, um, you know, not inclusive necessarily of, of folks who are born without vaginas. Um, there's also a joke in the film, not a joke, but the queer lady, the queer leader um, chant um, about, hey, hey, ho, ho, this penis party has to go. And of course, at the time when you have this cisgender hetero, like, you know, not hetero, but cisgender, like white privilege, we are thinking that that joke means you know, down with the patriarchy, down with the, with the man. But, you know, after making the film, the, the released version that has actually been pulled from the film. And I, I guess that this is a very long winded answer of saying that the organization itself realizes that it has to adapt and change and that the, the use, the, the membership um, has changed, and so the voice and the name and the merch and the logo has to be reflective of what the actual membership looks like. Um, and I think that while making this film, and Crystal, who is just so inspiring, really started this conversation inside of Roller Derby and inside our film crew, inside the Vagine regime, that we have to do better and... Um, I don't know, is that answering the question? Did I answer that question? <laughs> yes, you're right. Yes, thank you. It is very, it, it is, it's a, you know, it was tough, but I think those conversations need to happen. I think people particularly, you know, the cis skaters um, might have been a little apprehensive at first, but there have been a lot of like really amazing conversations that have come from that. And everyone realizes that um, you you can't, call yourself an international queer collective and not act like one and represent yourself that way. So now I think for the next roller con, there are also penis costumes. <laughs> so this last roller con, there were like vaginas running around and penises running around and a bunch of different variations of genitalia running around, which just makes for a better party anyway, in my opinion.
Yeah, I would actually say that the international popularity of, of the Vagine regime is quite extensive. Um, there's UK, there's um, Nordic, there's um, I think New Zealand and Australia. It's got a pretty far reach. And there's actually, I think it's, um, there's a huge game once a year called, I think it's um, something on the bent track. And it's like a huge um, game that also happens in Australia that's very similar to what you saw at RollerCon. And then there's also always VR games being set up between like France and Sweden. And, and so it's actually like quite a big community. What happens is, is different countries basically create their own VR merch logos, et cetera. And it's kind of like, if you want to make a VR chapter, you just do it. There's not really a lot of rules. I think that that's the kind of beauty of roller derby in general is that if you can find a flat spot that's large enough um, and you can get some roller skates and some people together, you can play roller derby. So that's kind of the same philosophy with the VR. Um, it's got a pretty big international presence. I'm not sure how huge it is in Canada, um, but you guys should get on that. Absolutely, I, I, have, I appreciate this question and I would um, challenge you a little bit to say that I think that women have always been um, participating in those sorts of sports or have always tried to and may have not had access. Um, uh, I, I, you know, just like any other person, I feel like there's something just about being a, a part of a team and being, you know, expressing yourself physically. And I think that when we found Crystal's story, that was one of the things that was the most heartbreaking was that here is a person who wanted to express themselves and was unable to because of their identity. And that, that is just unfathomable that, that, that you'd be cut off from that sort of, of expression. And I think roller derby, it is different, right? Like there are all these conversations about, oh, well, we should try to get roller derby in the Olympics. And it's like, well, do we really want to be in the Olympics? Like, oh, you need to do this and that so your fans will like the sport better. And it's like, but do we really care what the fans think? Um, the beauty of roller derby is that you have a bunch of people who, have, who are creating this sport and volunteering to push it forward and to make it better. And it's always evolving. And I think what makes roller derby unique is that it's not trying to be the NBA or the NFL, right? It's like we have our own little world going on and we are creating our own space and not trying to be something that we're not. And I think that there are a lot of people who have either been cut off from sports because of access or who have dealt with um, bullying or, you know, all sorts of things that might not have been attracted to this kind of very like heteronormative, like, you know, sports system that we have set up for ourselves. And I think roller derby attracts people who have played sports their whole lives. Um, people who have just come into, you know, playing sports. And that in and of itself, I think, is very, very unique. It has a wide usership in terms of age. Um, and, you know, when I was in high school, I the, the first time I was ever called a dyke, I was in high school. And um, the girls were giggling in the bathrooms, and they wouldn't... Um, come out and change in the normal area and I didn't know what was going on and one of them was like we don't want to change in front of you because you're a dyke and I was like 14 15 years old and I remember I went home that night and just cried myself to sleep and then I quit sports um I quit track I quit you know I didn't go back for track that year I quit basketball um 
because it was just not, a, I didn't feel like it was a safe space for me mentally to be in that position. And then what do you do when you're like a kid and you're not playing sports? Well, you do a lot of other things that might not be that great. So to see these junior roller derby leagues popping up all across the world and to see these young, these young athletes come and find roller derby and feel welcomed and to like, you know, in the video, the two, the two junior skaters where, where the one, the one skater is like, you know, they don't care. They just talk to me about the helmets on the side of my, or the stickers on the side of my helmet. Like it, I think back, if I would have had that when I was a young teenager going through all those awkward things that teenagers go through, I mean, I'm just amazed at this community and to see these junior skaters out there skating. It's just, honestly, it's the most, the best part of being a part of the community by far. So we created a Kickstarter video and originally the idea was to just make a film about like queer roller derby skaters. I have Fifi Nominon, Emma, a bunch of this, like adult skaters that you kind of see in the film that weave the, the narrative together. That was what my idea was. Um, honestly, it was, it was me as a like self-identified at the time lesbian who was going to make this lesbian film. And we made this Kickstarter and we got this letter in from Crystal and her mom. And <laughs> apparently Crystal had been on Karen's Facebook and she probably wasn't supposed to be, but she was on there and she was flipping through and she, and Karen plays roller derby. And so somehow someone had, had shared the Kickstarter video and Crystal watched the Kickstarter video and then went into the kitchen and was like, mom, we need to send these people all of our money so that they can make this movie, which is really funny. <laughs> and so of course they didn't send us all their money. Um, and they don't, you know, they're living in a, a situation where, you know, Karen works at a fast food restaurant and, and she's, uh, you know, doing everything she can to provide an amazing um, um, supportive environment for her kids. But they weren't going to send us all the money to make the movie. But what they did do is send us a letter. And that's the letter that you hear that Inger reads during the film. So immediately when we got Crystal's letter, I wasn't even thinking in terms of the film. Um, for one, I am a cisgender white person who was not embarking to tell a, to make a trans movie. Um, that felt, I mean, even when Crystal eventually asked to be a part of the movie, um, that felt like a really, really, really big responsibility. And also I just did not want to fuck it up. And so at that point we brought in a bunch of other producers and a bunch of other people to help continue to make the film because we wanted to really do it in the most responsible way. And um, yeah, it wasn't until probably six months into filming or eight months into filming and, and, and eight months into my friendship with Crystal because we started Skyping, we put up information um, about her story and people were just flooding with messages of support, gear, um, especially the teams in Canada that, that heard Crystal's story. I, I, I think there was um, the skate shop there in Montreal is the one that donated most of her gear. Um, so we set out to make one movie and then we met this incredible little girl who just well, in, in the movie you get to see her personality also she's just like fun to hang out with um as terrible as that sounds for a 35 year old person to admit that crystal's i mean crystal's way cooler than i am and um so yeah we as soon as as soon as she asked to be involved in the film and karen said yes we want to do this you know then the whole shift of our film moved and we made a different movie than really what we set out to do, but I think that in the end, there was no one who was really going to be able to tell the story of 
of that inclusivity, except for Crystal. And going back to the first question, it truly is because of Crystal that um, a bunch of us assholes really opened our eyes to what, what, what we could do to be better and do better. So not that that's Crystal's responsibility, but I'm blessed that she has, has been a part of my life. And um, it's just been an amazing journey to get to, to go around and share um, her courage and her tenacity with, with the world. So Crystal is, I think she'll be 13. Oh my gosh, I think 13, 12 or 13 um, in the fall. So she just turned 11 or 12. I'm terrible at numbers. Um, and things are going better for her at school. Since the film came out, um, the school has actually um, changed its policies on a few things. Crystal's now allowed to participate in individual sports, as I understand it, which is kind of weird to me. Like, she's allowed to do track and field and swimming and stuff like that, but I think she's still limited from playing on team sports, which, I mean, I can't understand the logic behind that. Um, and she that was the first time she was on the plane was there in LA and then since then um I think she's flown to four or five of the different screenings around Canada and also um in the United States uh so that's been really great like she's so over the movie at this point she's like this is so boring <laughs> I've seen this so many times so she always goes and does something fun in whatever city it is when we're screening the film and then comes back um and watches the Q and A, uh, but yeah, I think I think it's still a struggle. I think that Karen has a lot of of. I mean, she's just an amazing mother, and and she, you know, is still doing the best that she can. But I think that roller derby continues to provide a really positive environment for all of the whole family. Like you even see. Crystal's brother is like on skates now also. So it's a family affair. And yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it is, it ends the movie with like, this is the best day of my life. And I think it would be a little irresponsible to say that, oh, now everything's just perfect, you know, because she had to get back on a plane and go back to Timmins, which has already been defined as what, the worst city in the world? Is that what it said? Um, just in Canada. Just in Canada. Okay. The worst, so she had to go back to the worst city in Canada, whose main street is Shania Twain Drive, <laughs> by the way, which I thought was a joke until we got there, and every time we had to, like, position ourselves back, we're like, where's Shania Twain Drive? <laughs> which was pretty hilarious. So, Timmins. Um... But she loves playing video games. I think she has a really supportive online community in both the gaming world and also with roller derby. We probably Skype at least once a month still. Um, just the other day, she was sending me some pictures. Um, and I know that she has built even stronger relationships with some of the other skaters in the film. So, and I think one thing to think about is that you know, Crystal is kind of representative in this story, but there are so many other young people in this world that didn't get to be in a movie and fly and experience this. And I think that, you know, as inclusive as this world kind of pretends to be, there's so much more work that needs to be done. And... I think it's just one, you know, one step at a time. And, you know, yes, Crystal did have the best day of her life on that day, but then, you know, the world continues on and we all play a role in what her future will be and also the future of all of the other, you know, young kids out there that are struggling. So it's like happy.
happy ending but crying and all at the same time <laughs> because you can't fix everything and you can just be happy to see someone get to fulfill themselves in a moment and then I think be hopefully inspired to go out and make more of that in the world. We were, we were just so excited. We screened at like 60 film festivals this year. Uh, we, we traveled around and, and shared the, the story. Um, like I was saying, we just did a, a, a short re-edit um, because we obviously wanted to be responsible and go in and, and, and make some editorial changes to the film. And we just signed a distribution deal with a small boutique company, and they are currently prepping the film for online distribution. So uh, probably end of spring, you'll be seeing um, in the turn uh, Amazon, Netflix, those sorts of things. So we'll definitely be keeping people posted on the Vagine Regime Facebook page, also in the turn.com. Um, and, and we are this close from also being able to send out our Kickstarter prizes. I know people um, donated for Kickstarter and, and are really antsy to get their copy of the film. And now that we've got this distribution, we're able to do that. So uh, yeah, and then I just started another project. Um, I grew up in Oklahoma near um, my family's Native, Amer Native American reservation. And uh, my next project will be examining the sexual assault epidemic um, in Native America. I know that's also you know, a big topic there in Canada as well. So I'm moving from one, one, one passionate topic to another passion, um, a passionate uh, topic for me. So uh, it's just been a, a, you know, truly great experience to get to, to get to share the film with folks like yourselves and, and get to speak with you all. And by the way, I can't see anyone there. So it's like, I've been talking to myself this whole time if I look weird at all. Well, thank you so much. We're really looking forward to your next project. And I'm sure everyone here really appreciated that. And we'll spread the word far and wide and people are nodding with their heads. So maybe we'll give one last round of applause for her.